Hi everyone, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I figured this was better than ending up in a ditch on the side of 140 or worse. So I just want to update you on an uh, ongoing scenario planning project we have across uh, several uh, INM regions in the West. To start, how did this project come about? Well, like so many things, we were standing around uh, BSing in a group at the uh, George Wright Society in 2015, um, although we were much better dressed than this dramatic reenactment portrays. And there was some funding available uh, for a network project. And we had folks in the conversation from the Klamath, Sierra, Upper Columbia Basin regions and, and Crater Lake. And um, some of the folks were, were Johnny Nesmith down in Sierra, uh, Tom, Roadhouse up in, in Bend and Alice, who's right there in the room with y'all, uh, and decided that uh, we would undertake uh, initiating a climate change scenario planning project. And initially we thought we'd focus on Montana and high elevation. Talking with some climate change adaptation experts, um, we decided that we should really uh, narrow that focus due to our, our limited uh, resources. Such. So we picked two species to focus on, um, these that occurred across all of our regions, um, had a fair bit of, of monitoring behind them, were of conservation interest, and were relatively phylogenetically disparate, as, you, as you'll see. So these were really a weird rabbit and a craggy pine tree, the American pika and whitebark pine and its associated um, five needle. And more than what I just listed, they have high range overlap. Uh, during the last glacial period, they had range expansion, greater connectivity and gene flow than they have now, and have recently, especially recently, experienced uh, range retraction and fragmentation. Um, and there are likely uh, critical refugia within our parks regions that, that will be very important to uh, them potentially surviving um, the, the current uh, we have right now. And this is likely true not of these two species, but many of the other montane specialists with which they share these systems. So hopefully more broadly applicable. What is scenario planning if you're not familiar? Well, basic idea is the future is uncertain, especially in light of climate change. So scenario planning is a tool of climate change adaptation. Um, a more formal definition, it's really a creative way to think about um, possible futures with high levels of uncertainty, high levels of complexity, and low levels of control. How can we think strategically, creatively about these futures and how we might deal with them? If you Google scenario planning methods, you'll get a range of, of details. You'll probably get some figures like this, some snazzy diagrams. Um, this one from the Climate Change Program. Here's one from Fish and Wildlife Service. When you talk to experts, they say really it's a flexible process. Don't be too encumbered by one of these models. So how did we go about it to meet our particular needs? Um, well, we built a, a suite of teams from across the regions. We hosted a couple workshops, one for each of our focal species where we identified uh, key drivers and uncertainties. And then we're still integrating then that workshop output with current literature to ultimately help uh, inform future uh, scenario narrative development, as well as um, uh, other next steps, which would in include, of course, actionable uh, management options. So what have we learned so far? I'll break this into two parts, the process and uh, the content itself. So. Um, I think the process is important. What have we learned? Um, if you're going to undertake this yourself, keep the, those initial teams small. I would say five or six people um, and invite people who really have an inherent interest in the project rather than a, their own agenda or they're just of high status or it's convenient for them or they want something out of it like publications or funding but really want to see the project succeed in, in and of its own right. Um, and include a scenario planning expert, especially one that has a good experience and background in natural resources and, or, or whatever the focus of your project is. Um, for our region, that's Holly Hartman. She was just invaluable in our PICA uh, workshop, um, incredible background, knowledge and information, was really able to keep our conversations focused and aimed towards um, our ultimate goals uh, of scenario planning and, and actionable management. 
During workshops, really have clear goals and outcomes. Uh, be clear what you want people to do. Uh, provide some framework, but be flexible. Allow for novel insight and some rabbit trails. Um, keep com Have conversations with the team before the workshop so people come in kind of ready to go, understanding what you're going to do and scenario planning, climate change adaptation. Get everything down. Have a large whiteboard where you can um, display the ongoing conversation and its evolution for everyone to see. Um, of course, keep everyone fed and watered uh, before and after. Um, you know, and, and expect the challenge then of getting a lot of information and then trying to figure out how best to communicate and sum summarize and communicate that. So, uh, you know, here's uh, many hours of work during a PICA workshop. Um, how do we take this and then make this useful? And, and that's one of the things certainly we're doing now and I'm doing right now. Too. Um, Expect taxes to vary greatly in the amount of information available. I mean, we all kind of know this, but you know, when you're digging in, it can be hard when you're 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 thinking about a different taxa and you want to answer the same questions for each taxa. So if we do a quick search on Google Scholar, we see um, exemplified here that White Bark Pine has a lot more research behind it than American Pika does. We'd be a lot better off if we were studying, say, gray wolves, um, and even better off if we wanted to do uh, climate change scenario planning for fruit flies. Um, but information, we'll come back to that. So out of that flow diagram I showed you, we've, we've identified a range of overlapping categories. We can fit these key drivers and their uncertainties into um, these overlapping categories, geology, climate, biology, ecology, sociopolitical factors, and technological factors. I don't have time to go into all these. Um, of these aspects and explore some of these uh, key drivers. Okay, so in terms of climate, precipitation and snowpack are the big ones. We know temperature um, has a fairly high certainty of continued warming. We've seen a lot of warming. This is results for Crater Lake from work Bill Monahan and Nick Fisichelli have done. Um, but precipitation, much less clear. There are some trends, but it's highly variable in space and time. Um, but then precipitation and temperature interact um, to have highly variable snow certainty. So we see that geographically and in timing and extreme snowpack has a huge amount of uncertainty, but with huge implications for many, many other factors. But we can use this information, say we were to just use these two factors to inform some potential scenario narratives, you know, from a ski industry or a skier perspective, um, here's what those might look like, uh, you know, from one extreme where, you know, get out the beater skis and hit the rocks uh, to, you know, Warren Miller's ultimate daydream of a, a much snowier future. Um, so where do we fall into these? We can then use these uh, scenario narratives and think about how climate uncertainty can drive uncertainty in other key drivers. So these key drivers, of course, have their own inherent uncertainty, which is amplified and interacts with the, these climate uncertainties to generate even greater uncertainty. Um, so things like hydrology and soil properties, fire, dynamics, uh, mosaics, patterns, phenology, um, species interactions, the competition, encroachment, invasion, pests and disease, both enzootic and epizootic, novel diseases, emerging diseases, um, the phenological synchrony of multiple species and how they might be becoming uh, mismatched. We can think about how all these combined impacts ultimately affect individual fitness, um, connectivity of populations and habitat and their gene flow, and persistence of populations and metapopulations, which these are the ultimately the things um, that we are concerned about. We also expect some uncertainty coming from uh, lack of natural history knowledge, what I mentioned before. So for pica, uh, there's a lot of missing information. There is for white bark too. Um, just fundamental natural history uh, within and across regions and across the whole species. Things like reproductive variation in space and time, individual mortality and turnover and its drivers, a dispersal capacity, rate, frequency, 
across ages uh, and, and, and regions. Um, physiological tolerances uh, and its impact on fitness and how those play out across different environmental factors. Um, adaptive capacity uh, versus plasticity and how these vary across time and space. So things like dietary plasticity. I mean, we have Columbia River Gorge uh, pika eating tons of moss, right? Um, and then the phenology of these species. I mean, fundamental aspects of biology that we, we understand very poorly and especially how they interact with uh, climate and environmental drivers. All of this uncertainty also varies across space at a landscape scale, across diverse biogeographic landscapes, which our regions represent from the Sierra Nevada, Crater Lake in the, in the Southern Cascades, uh, Craters of the Moon um, out in Idaho, uh, Newberry Crater. Um, all of these landscapes vary widely. Uh, research from Castillo et al. at Crater Lake showed that topographic complexity um, was one of the top factors determining pica dispersal. And we see incredible topographic complexity um, across all these regions. So what does that mean for a whole range of factors, a, a large source of uncertainty and something we need to better understand and will drive the need for regionally specific scenario planning because of many of these differences. There's also scientific uncertainty. This could maybe fall under technological, but we have many competing species level models of future change. How do we better understand these and reconcile these? Um, understanding a uh, huge scientific understanding, uh, uncertainty over understanding things like genetic and functional connectivity, um, adaptive capacity and local adaptation, which are key um, in the replaceability of populations. And the need for, there's the, a need for reconciling modeling efforts. These can be challenging to dis, uh, decipher from scientists and especially for policymakers and managers. There's a hugely confusing mix of methods, conflicting results. Results can seem impenetrable and confusing. How are they all connected? So one of the things we're working on is developing model genealogies. This example here is for a number of projects uh, on Colorado River flow projections. So how can we sort of map the connections between all these projects and make them more understandable um, in, a, in a sort of a genealogy or phylo phylogenetic context? So we can go on and on about bi biology and ecology, I'd certainly like to, but there's a lot more. I was very na naive going into this and, and really mainly thinking about biological and ecological issues, but there's a lot more. Um, there's sociopolitical and technological factors um, and their uncertainties, and these are equally important. So really, I tend to now just sort of thinking of it as change scenario planning. For example, millions of people around the world, when I say pica, are going to are going to think the picture on the right when I'm thinking the picture on the left. Um, but in terms of feasibility and constraints, uh, feasibility constraints, they're, they're extremely variable and uncertain as well. So things like funding, um, the sources and amounts and priorities. I mean, now probably more than more than ever are these uncertain, or at least as we head into 2017 with um, with changes in, in, in our uh, political situation, to say the least. Long-term monitoring, funding for long-term monitoring has always been challenging. Long-term programs like the White Pine Blister Rust Resistance Programs, and these are like sending a kid to, through college. Uh, policy management in designated wilderness areas is, is a difficult subject, and, and many of the populations of both these taxa are, are in wilderness areas. Um, single species versus landscape management um, perspectives, um, support for proactive management as opposed to just reactive management, as, as is often the case. Uh, how do we address uh, perceived risk versus reward? Um, uncertainty here, uh, you know, for example, uh, assisted migration, something very controversial, um, high risk, uh, potential low reward versus increased functional connectivity, something that's low risk, um, but potentially high reward in the end. So another key thing that emerged out of our conversations is this icon problem we see for this, these and many other species. You know, there, we have our Pikas in Peril Research Project, which has, is a catchy title, but you know, when species become iconic in terms of their sort of perilous situation, um, they tend to think of them being in trouble everywhere. But some icons have the capacity to persist, and these and that includes these two. 
Um, there's an opportunity to educate people here about the complexities of persistence and promote a, a, a perspective of optimism towards facilitating adaptation to future change. So our next steps, uh, we're going to move to, towards scenario uh, narrative development and actionable management options. We need to understand needs of individual parks with, within our regions. Uh, we want to inform and support regional efforts like the upcoming regional synthesis report from our regions. Uh, we want to uh, outline funding and leadership models and, and practical scenario planning models that really can be uh, fast, inexpensive, and iterative um, and can fit into adaptive management plans. Um, and, and of course, we need to identify, make sure people are involved. Um, use scenarios to identify feasible low risk short term actions that can provide long term benefit um, and greater, uh, a greater range of, of flexibility in the future. Um, support resistance to change, resilience in systems, connectivity, and, and adapt, adaptation and, and adaptive capacity in these systems. Okay, so uh, this will be posted, is posted to YouTube. Um, please uh, feel free to email me or give me a call if you have any questions. Again, sorry I'm not there. Hope you have a great rest of the meeting and um, maybe we'll, we'll hopefully see you out there soon. Okay, thanks very much.